Hi, good morning, dear friends. Uh, my name is Veena Sikri. Um, when I heard about the blank slate, the first thought that came to my mind is the life of the girl child. Why should this be so? All of us in India, and I would say across South Asia, we are fiercely aspirational for our respective children. We will brook no obstacle. We will make every sacrifice. We want to make sure that our children get to be the best. And that is a good thing in a way, but it has some caveats. It is almost the first point of bonding between a parent and a child, this sense of aspirationism, the sense of doing very well, and the sense that, you know, no matter whether I'm rich or I'm poor, any status in society, any religion, any ethnicity, I am going to be fiercely aspirational for my child. But then, why is it that there's a caveat? The question comes, is this aspirationalism equal for all your children? Is it the same for the boy child and the girl child? Now that is the critical question. Why is it that in India and South Asia, the blank slate can only refer to the life of the girl child? Hers can be a blank slate forever if she is the victim of feticide or infanticide. Even when she is born, the key questions that determine the first entries on her blank slate are, is she wanted or unwanted? Is she loved or unloved? Is she equal to the boy child? So dear parents, my first question to you is, my first request to you is to have a complete equality between the boy child and the girl child. Bring in a sense of equality and respect for all your children. It is devastating for the girl child to learn that no matter how good she is, the progress and success of the boy child is more important for the parents. Why should this be so? Why should it be like that? So I think we have to make a special effort to make sure that this feeling of equality, this feeling of respect for all children is imbibed by the children regardless. And you must understand that these impressions come to the children from the home. That is why it is the responsibility of the parents. Discussions at the dinner table, casual conversations, attitudinal approaches of parents to different children. And these memories, these impressions stay with the girl child forever. It's like mother's cooking. It never leaves you. It never goes away. So this is the effort. Schools don't do it. They should do it. Maybe we should all work for schools to do it. But they don't. This question of ethics, of non-violence, of telling children to be, uh, to be a good sportsman. It does not matter whether you win or lose. It's how you play the game. But that doesn't happen. So parents have to do it. And since the conundrum is about the boy child, maybe there should be a special effort to instill in the boy child a sense of equality, a sense of not being superior. Now that's interesting because this sense of superiority is what becomes a problem in later life. If there is housework to be done, share it equally. Why should the boy play cricket and the girl do the laundry or the cooking or look after siblings? Let them share that work. Let them share everything. But you know, in all this, it is the attitude of the father that is the most important. Boys imbibe attitudes from their fathers, even though they may be much more bonded and closer with their mothers. And this aspect, this sense of superiority, this has another disturbing element to it. In later life, can it be that this innate sense of, of, of entitlement, of superiority, of impunity because you're the boy child, can this contain within it the seeds of violence, the seeds of future gender-based violence, molestation, sexual harassment, gender-based violence in all its forms? Can it come from this sense of superiority? Because if you have an innate equality, if you respect somebody, if you think you're equal to somebody, will you attack and harm that person? So this is, I think, a very, very important aspect that we have to look at when we look at aspirationalism, when we look that we have to have equal aspirations and that you have to evolve aspirations in tune with your children. What are their capabilities? What are their talents? In my life, I have actually been very lucky in imbibing this sense of gender equality, a strong sense of being the same right from my childhood. In my family, there are three girls, no boys, so there was no problem of equality there. But at the same time, we were taught to be 
uh, strong yet feminist, and but also not to brook any kind of uh, discrimination, any kind of equality. The love of my parents was one of the warmest and most intense feelings of my youth. It's like a warm blanket. I can draw it around me any time. Aspirations were discussed and evolved and talked. We tried everything, sports, music, classical dance. My mother wanted me to be a doctor. I loved academia. I loved travel, foreign languages. So I chose to try for the foreign service exam. And there was no prouder moment for my parents that when I topped, I came first in the All India UPSC civil service examination. <laughs> but do you know, I almost did not join the service. At that time, there were a whole lot of antiquated rules. The first rule was, a married woman could not join the foreign service. Why? A married man could. Then there was a problem. By this time, I had met my life partner, my future husband, Rajiv Sikri, and we wanted to get married and have careers in tandem. Would this be possible? The then foreign secretary was very helpful on that, and I joined. But the other rule I came across was, a female officer had to apply for permission to get married. A male officer did not have to apply for such permission. And when I applied for the permission, I got a very pompous letter saying that, yes, but you may be called upon to resign in due course if something happens. And then when we went on our first posting to Moscow, I found that husband and wife posted in the same place did not have equal pay and allowances. But a husband and wife posted in India in the same place did have equal pay and allowances in the civil service. So these were the kind of uh, inequalities that we came across. Can I have some water, please? <clears throat> so um, <coughs> fighting these, fighting battles for gender equality, this was what I did. And this, at this time, I remembered the lessons taught to be by my parents. Our careers, my husband and wife's career, have been great. But I must say straight away at this point that once again, it is bringing men on board that is vital. My husband has been a life partner, a sharing partner, a caring partner. At every point, whenever it is gender equality or looking after the children, sharing every aspect, he has been with me side by side. Without that, it is not possible. So I do believe that it is a partnership. That, that how, often do you, how often do you empathize, you feel for your wife's career? It's important. It's vital. Please go ahead and do this. And I thank my life partner, Rajiv Sikri, for being so... Uh, side by side with me, shoulder by shoulder with me throughout. We had terrific, exciting careers. We were, uh, even as a probationary officer, I was on liaison duty with Benazir Bhutto in 1972 when she came with her father, then President Zulfikar Ali Bhutto to Shimla. That was a great experience. In Moscow, we were there for six long winters in two tenures. The first time it was Leonid Brezhnev. The second time was Mikhail Gorbachev with Glasnost and Perestroika. A great rejuvenating time. In the Indian mission to the UN, I was working on the first North-South dialogue between the rich countries of the North and the developing countries of the South. And it was such a great experience as spokesman of the G77 to talk about this, as alternate representative of the Security Council to talk about the Council for Namibia, the end of decolonization, the end of apartheid. These were the issues that we fought about. And then in 1997, in Hong Kong, I saw the end of the British Raj when Hong Kong was handed back to China and the British colonial flag came down for the last time. That was a great experience. I had great times in Malaysia, in Paris, but the most exciting experience I had are in South Asia our neighboring countries. I was in Nepal and then as High Commissioner in Bangladesh. Now the people of South Asia, we share a civilizational heritage, we share a cultural heritage, we have an economic independence, there is great sensitivity of the people of South Asia, there is the media swaying public opinion, there are enormous interactions in education, in trade, in security concerns, these are vital. So I think this is where India's first string of foreign policy is, this is where you have to be a great success and I have enjoyed my time, but then when I left government, this also has its own points of discrimination and I uh, you know, took up the government on the question of RTI and CAT because of the then government's discriminatory policies. But immediately after I left government, I joined academia as a professor and I set up this group called the South Asia Women's Network. This is a group of nine countries, the eight uh, SARC countries and Myanmar as well. 
and we work on sustainable development for the women of South Asia. It is amazing that in South Asia, in our neighborhood, we have some of the individual women who have reached the greatest heights in the world. In terms of presidents and prime ministers, you'll be surprised to know that South Asia has the number one position in the world. India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal. We've had presidents and prime ministers for many, many years. But has this changed the position of women on the ground? It has not. We have the same uh, uh, derogatory position of women. They are discriminated against. Uh, their work is not recognized. Their work is not included in the GDP. So this is a tremendously anomalous situation for the, work, for the women of South Asia. And I decided to take it up by creating SWAN. We call ourselves SWAN. And working on sustainable development for the women of South Asia. Now here again, when I came to this work, we looked in different areas, we looked at all, uh, you know, environment, education, health and nutrition, women in media, women in peacemaking, um, crafts and textiles, art and literature, everywhere we saw, the problem is the mindset. The mindset is what it is. The patriarchal system in India and South Asia has created a mindset that mitigates against women's equality. It gives her a subordinate role in family and society, even though she is doing so much. So we decided to go ahead and we decided to take up this issue of mindset. We decided to see that we must bring men on board. We must work with them because constitutional equality is there. The legal laws are there, but in the implementation, the woman comes up against the glass ceiling. And the woman is doing all the work. There is unpaid care work in the home. There is unpaid agricultural work, which is not included in the GDP. Out of 20 activities between sowing and harvesting, women are doing 17, but not in the GDP. There is this whole aspect of the unorganized sector. The vast majority of women in India and South Asia are working in the unorganized sector. They have no security of pay, no security of work and their work is not included in the GDP. So there is a tremendous amount to be said for this, and the reason I'm saying it is that it may seem that this is a human rights issue, which it is, but today, the lack of equality of women has become the foremost developmental issue for South Asia. We have to know that unless we, we cannot achieve sustainable development, unless we bring women on par, give them the central role, give them the stakeholders' role, don't see them as objects of development. What is happening today in the process of econ uh, economic development, we create formulae for women. Okay, this is good for you, do this. But they have to be stakeholders. Take the issue of malnutrition. South Asia has the largest number of malnutritioned women and children in the world. The demographic dividend we talk about can become a demographic nightmare because the next generation is affected by this. There is one social habit in South Asia. The woman eats last in the family. Maybe in the economically prosperous communities, it's fine. But for the vast majority, we do not know whether she's getting adequate nutrition. She may be feeding a baby, expecting a baby, but nobody looks to see after everybody has eaten what is left. So is it surprising that we have uh, the largest number of malnutrition women and children in the world? How do you overcome it? Make that woman the center of your solution. Make, take her along with you. Don't just tell her what she should do. Make her her partner. We have done this, for example, we have a project on women in media. Because media today creates mindsets. How do you report on women's issues? How do you report on sexual harassment? So we've done it. We've seen that the media is creating these mindsets. Let's take it up. Let's see what should be done with editors, with owners, with reporters, with governments. Is there adequate protection for women? Are adequate safeguards in place for reporting on women in media? So this, these are the issues, it's livelihoods issues, skills development issues. The women have the skills, but they don't get any return for it. Somebody else comes, they create the beautiful object, somebody comes, the middleman takes it away, she gets nothing for it. So it's an enormous task, but we are determined that men have to be part of it. Because if this attitude has to be changed, men and women have to do it together. There is no revolution we seek, there is an evolution of thought that we seek. And we seek everybody to come on board to make sure that this aspect of gender equality and gender empowerment doesn't remain a dream, doesn't remain on paper, part of the constitution, but becomes a reality. Through that, we can ensure that India will develop much faster. The International Monetary Fund and others have done studies today. They are working on this. They are seeing that if you bring women as part of the economic process, India could double its growth in a very short 
space of time. Other countries could achieve, and they've said, work together as a region. Learn from each other's best practices. Understand what the other person is doing. There is no need to reinvent the wheel. So we have taken all this to heart. We are working together, and we look forward to an occasion where we will have complete gender equality and empowerment for all of us. One for all and all for one. Thank you.